Hi and welcome everybody to today's show. The topic for today is permaculture economics beyond circular economy. Today we have a special guest from the United States, Dr. Alan Enso from Permaculture Education. Um, hi Alan, how are you doing? Hi, how are you? I'm fine. I'm excited to talk with you today about uh, yeah, permaculture and uh, circular economy. Why are we talking about this today? Um, I think it's a pretty interesting topic, thinking from the European perspective. Uh, mainly, um, just recently, the European Union announced the European Green Deal. Yeah, everybody's talking about the new Green Deal, so to say. And uh, actually, in the US, they were also mentioning the uh, Green Deal. Um, so it's worth talking about it today. So what does the EU actually want? The EU wants to become a climate neutral continent and they want to be a worldwide leader when it comes to green energy, green technology and resource efficiency. So yeah, when we see one of the quotes from uh, Ursula von der Leyen, for example, it says the European Green Deal is our new growth strategy. It will help us cut emissions while creating jobs. Huh? So what will we do? Yeah, they will work on energy, buildings, industry, mobility. So they actually want to decarbonize the energy sector. They want to reduce and uh, improve uh, the footprints from buildings. Yeah, and they want to obviously create a new industry model. So that's where we actually mostly will talk about also today when we talk about uh, circular economy. So this is more or less um, the start for today. Um, the Green Deal of the EU and also the circular economy. So... And so when we think about a circular economy, yeah, I think of permaculture because actually, how did I get to know Enso? I did the permaculture design certificate course with you and actually you have a really interesting e-learning model that was already uh, quite in place or distance learning model already in the 80s. No, It was founded basically by Bible Modison. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about what is permaculture and what does it have to do with uh, circular economy? All right, thank you. Um, let's see, permaculture, my, my personal definition is permaculture represents the most sensible ways of sustaining and enriching life without causing environmental or social degradation. So that is probably the shortest definition of permaculture you'll come across. Um, but basically, um, it starts with design. A lot of people use the word permaculture, but they don't say permaculture design. And unfortunately, people think um, because it's very popular in circles with gardening and farming that permaculture is just about farming and gardening, but mm -hmm. it's not. It's about design. Um, it's uh, applicable to our um, economy, um, each individual business, um, regional economies, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, what we call in permaculture bioregional. Um, and this is one of the important factors that we look at when we design local economies using permaculture design. Um, but we could talk about that a little later. <laughs> yeah, of course. So um, when we think then of permaculture, what I always have in mind is, yeah, permaculture is obviously a system inspired by nature and we know nature works in circles. So um, that's where I see the biggest uh, parallel between permaculture and circular economy. But when we think about circular economy, uh, mainly everybody's talking about technology. Yeah? So, and, and everybody's praising technology as the, uh, yeah, the best way. But also permaculture um, proposes lots of solutions, how to create circles. So maybe you can give us some ideas of how to become more circular without uh, using technology, because I think permaculture is a great way to to teach us how to become more sustainable in a natural way, right? Yeah, um, and a good point there is that um, even without technology, um, we can make things circular. And the whole, the whole idea is to eliminate waste in the process. And we use a lot of techniques and systems that um, local, and historical indigenous people have used. Mm -hmm. So um, when we design with permaculture, we kind of use the newest technologies such as solar and renewable energies, but we also um, 
hold a very special place for that indigenous knowledge, indigenous knowledge that, that these systems have already been um, working. Um, they're not new. We're just kind of reminding humanity that we have these, these ways of living and these ways of working um, that do not involve large residual waste um, in the system. Um, and that do not involve inequality and um, allowing corruption to creep into every aspect of the, the chain. So you would also say that when you use permaculture, you're not against using technology, but you also say you, you use uh, the newest technology. But I think in permaculture, one term that is really important for everybody maybe also to think about, appropriate technology. Uh, I remember taking that in your course and I really like the topic to think about what is an appropriate technology. Maybe you can uh, say something about that because it has to do with input-output relationship, right? When it comes to be, uh, define what is an appropriate technology. So maybe some, some thoughts about that. Yeah, there are certain technologies such as uh, solar and wind power, hydropower, those are renewable and um, they don't take a lot of, well, embodied energy in the making of these um, systems. I would say solar, you know, that, that's a significant amount of embodied energy in making solar panels. And um, the higher you get with the complexity in, um, in the technology, you're gonna have uh, more rare earth minerals and things like that. So that are harder to get at and harder to get in the earth. So you're, you're getting more, you're getting less sustainable as you get more complex and more rare, hard to get materials in your process. <laughs> so then one solution would be to, to be less complex, to live a simpler life. Is that then the proposal of permaculture or can you also combine like let's say a modern life with a simpler life? Is that compatible with permaculture? It's all about choices. So when I see a choice of something, uh, maybe it's a household appliance, one that's made in China that is $5 um, that may last a few months mm -hmm. or one that's from another country that um, is very well made and might last me a whole lifetime that I can repair. Mm -hmm. So I choose the one that's going to last longer and the one that was made with more sustainable materials and um, so in every area of our life, we can make these choices. And what's the best, what's the, the most sustainable choice and what's uh, the choice I should avoid. So actually you mentioned just a really interesting uh, point here, the repair. And um, I'm, I'm sure in the US and you always mentioned many uh, things for me, that's also pretty much circular economy, like opening of repair shops or community sourcing uh, projects. Uh, you always mentioned, why does everybody has to have a lawnmower? Uh, why don't we share? So sharing economy is pretty circular, so to say, because we use less resources and we extend the usage. Repairing, um, upcycling, other ideas uh, we can use for being more circular. Um, maybe innovation around uh, like re reduction of inputs. That's something we can talk about. Well, the, the innovation is around looking at your supply chain and changing that supply chain to be more sustainable and to... Um, not pull products from necessarily far around the world, but try to make your product with um, ingredients that are more sustainable, more natural, and more local. Mm -hmm. So and actually, of, so actually, so maybe then um, when we think of what's now the hype is about technology and circular economy, and uh, maybe people disregard the natural way, but actually, there's also lots of research when it comes to finding new natural materials like let's say bioplastics yeah maybe what's your opinion on, on bioplastics um, that's also a pretty uh, ambiguous topic right yeah i mean if we can get away from using petrol crude oil for everything mm -hmm. this is the reason we have wars this is the reason uh, all the fighting is going on this is the reason mm -hmm. we have oceans full of plastic mm -hmm. and air that we can't breathe um, this is all, a lot of it, a, a big, big problem is all of this petrol that we use for everything. 
there's absolutely no reason that we should we don't have electric cars on the road and we still have these gas burning mm -hmm. uh, machines um, around there's there's absolutely no reason for that um, except for uh, greed and people not allowing the sustainable options to get to the market okay so um so we see there's lots of compatibility actually between uh, permaculture and uh, circular economy. And when it comes to my own opinion, for me, permaculture goes beyond uh, the circular economy because the circular economy is really trying to uh, focus on the technological part. But uh, maybe that's not the not the whole picture. But we can uh, at the end uh, we maybe come to a vision uh, that permaculture has on to go beyond uh, when we talk about local economy and things like that. Maybe that's then we leave that for the end. Before I want to ask you some some more uh, questions on how to look at permaculture uh, with a business mindset, yeah, um, because like we said in the beginning, uh, many people associate it maybe with agriculture and gardening. So for me, it's much bigger, and I see uh, inspiring projects from around the world. So um, thinking of a business or thinking of a society, how can permaculture? Um, in a practical way, improve, for example, the footprint of a company. How can we look at what can we do with permaculture on a company level? And when we think of a planning of a, of a city, for example, how can we um, apply permaculture? One idea that pops into my mind, for example, a rooftop farm on a hospital, is that also permaculture? Well, I mean, I like the idea of using the rooftop and um, having a green roof, but I don't agree with any um, food growing system that is not connected to the earth. Mm -hmm. And that's just a personal thing. I mean, some people are very much into aquaponics mm -hmm. um, that does not interact with the earth. Um, I'm a big proponent of getting food that's grown in the earth. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's more nutrient dense and you might have something that looks like a tomato come out of a system like aquaponics, but it's not going to taste like anything. It doesn't, it's not um it's not the real <laughs> not the real so, tomato so, so there, but on a, couldn't you put the uh, soil on a rooftop either isn't it possible to put like like real earth on a rooftop uh, of a building yes but with permaculture what you're trying to do is reduce human mm -hmm. labor as well mm -hmm. um getting earth on a regular basis up to the roof of a building is very um intensive work and um not efficient at all uh, it would be much better to have a garden that's on the ground. Um, okay, so when we think then of like city design, uh, we have the rooftops, and when we think of permaculture, it says make use of your resources. So we have all these rooftops. What would you, we use them for? For uh, solar panels and uh, and uh, wind engines, or what? What would be a good idea then to use the resources of the rooftops? And the next question would be, how can we then grow food? inside of the city should it be then more like community gardens um, or how can can we engage into growing the food in an urban environment because not everybody has the chance to live on the countryside where it's obviously easier to grow your own food for example right um well the imagination of the architect is important here in the united states we have a lack of imagination in architecture mm -hmm. and a lot of the buildings look the same uh, you have these buildings going up now, which are high density buildings, as part of the Agenda 21 thing, I think, but they're, mm -hmm. they're trying to pack in as much square footage on a lot as you can. Mm -hmm. and the buildings are ugly and they're square and um, not uh, efficient and, you know. Um, Made for sardines, uh, not for humans. But the idea I, uh, that I thought of with the uh, rooftop gardens was why can't you design the building to be starting from the ground level and then going up and then you'd have an easy way to take care of the gardens that are at the top by just going from ground level all the way up you might have at the front you might have all these stories all these floors but on the back you know there's access to that roof garden that you're talking mm -hmm. about um so, so that's that about be... how it how the energy is flowing actually in a design so that's basically a, a very important question how energy is flowing through a system okay interesting um so other ideas for for businesses how can they apply permaculture to their daily operations ideas 
look at vertical integration, um, the things you might be purchasing from other companies that are part of your product that you could possibly produce locally or internally yourself mm -hmm. um, and source um, your supply chain. Mm -hmm. Clean, green your supply chain, um, keep it as local as possible. That way you're more insulated against uh, economic shocks and things like that as well. Okay, and then when we like listen now uh, to what you say about permaculture and now I become interested into permaculture and to become more circular. So on a personal level, what can I actually do uh, now that I'm going out of the show? Um, what can I do to be more sustainable on an individual level, for example? Well, on an individual level, it, again, look at your choices that you're making with your food. Um, vote with your dollars, vote with mm -hmm. your, with your feet, um, uh, and take a permaculture design course and learn how to design uh, the aspects of your life, the aspects of your economics, um, the aspects of your homestead, how to run your homestead in an efficient manner um, while reducing waste and increasing your health um, and the health of the planet. Sounds great. So one more thing, talking about uh, permaculture economics, um, when we talk about regional economics and local economic systems, um, that's one of the solutions proposed. So maybe you can um, give a little idea on what that means so people could think of what does permaculture uh, have in mind, how to improve our societies. Yeah, That's very interesting, okay. I think, for everybody to hear. Well, um, back in the 80s when, you know, Bill Molson and David Holmgren started teaching, the aspects of economics were termed financial permaculture, but that's actually not a proper term because it's actually local economic design. So it's um, a more appropriate term would be permaculture economics. Mm -hmm. um, basically, what we've seen in the past 20 30 years is a move towards globalization, centralization of economic markets and activity, and decision making. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What we want to do with permaculture is move that back, relocalization, relocalize decision making, mm -hmm. um, and uh, relocalize the economic power um, that individuals have instead of money being sucked out of local communities by large multinational corporations, mm -hmm. we are turning the tables and um, creating our own local economies and our own local um, institutions mm -hmm. that can be perfectly insulated from that wider predatory um, system that we all know. So the idea is to like create little, so to say, um self-sufficient communities that are also interacting with other regions yeah? and you have also your own financial system so to say maybe you have your own currencies and uh, local bartering system set up that's also part of the, the solution right yes uh, what you what you do is with local economic design is um, look at the natural assets that are in your bioregion so a bioregion is um, instead of the boundaries that we all know states and counties and countries mm -hmm. um, erase all those boundaries and what you have are natural boundaries mountain ranges lakes rivers mm -hmm. um, valleys mm -hmm. so you would look at your natural area and what nature is providing in abundance and those would be uh, the ideal um, inputs that you would use for local businesses um, keeping sure, you know, that they're used sustainably, mm -hmm. those, those local resources. Interesting. So it's a bit a trend back, going back to local, but we still stay connected. So it's not contradicting with the globalized world. We can still be globalized, but have like more, more economic activity based in local. And like you said, the important thing again is how is energy flowing? So it makes a big difference if I go to a big supermarket chain, although I buy organic, It's still a different uh, calculation than buying it from a local food corporation, maybe even um, a cooperative. 
um, it's a complete different balance in the, in the money system, right? Yes, and this brings up an important point that um, locally, we can create our own solutions. There's absolutely no need for us to uh, go to our um, local, regional, and national level politicians and say, please do something for us. Mm -hmm. You know, this is mm -hmm. what we see um, with the climate um, change information now is that people say, do something, do something. Do, but mm -hmm. when you are asking, you know, politicians and um, people at that level to do something, uh, you may not like what they end up doing. Mm -hmm. uh, what they end up doing might only benefit multinational corporations and the banks and politicians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, turn that around and let's start locally. Let's start at our back door and let's start designing our local economy from there. Um, have the benefits flow, you know, the, the other direction. Mm -hmm. So um, basically we're creating local independence and um, kind of relocalizing all of this activity, economics, food production, business. Um, and it's the way of the future. This is the way everything's turning. So um, it's a good thing for people to, to learn about. Yeah, for sure. And when you mention all these things, it's a pretty much a bottom up approach. And always when it comes into my mind, um, that people have to learn also to be bottom up and uh, to not be just looking at what um, politicians are doing. So now when we you mention an interesting point, because actually today we are talking about the political agendas. We're talking about the Green Deal. We talk about uh, the circular yeah. economy that it is uh, basically in a, it is a top top down idea now. OK, we need to have circular economy. We need to have the Green Deal. So it is what you are saying. It goes the same way. It's other people who are deciding over our heads a little bit. What is going on? Not obviously everything is bad behind that, so it can also be a really good seat. But what I uh, really um, wanted to uh, finish with now is that maybe people have to also learn how to collaborate first, because when we talk about local economic planning, um, we, we talked about also like dynamic uh, governance, yeah, for example, like or participatory uh, governance. People have to learn how to decide together, yeah, so that. Uh, it's also an interesting uh, uh, point. Maybe some um, final words for us. How can we learn how to collaborate? Well, um, one of the things that we all gather around in the world of permaculture is we all agree on the ethics. Mm -hmm. And um, when we start with earth care and then we go to people care and then we go to return the surplus, um, these these ideas are ethical. Um, what we're missing in that um, top-down economic design is there's no ethics. Uh, mm -hmm. there's, n there's not an ethical basis for it. There's a, um, there's a climate basis for it. There's a um, money basis for it, but it's not an ethical basis. And um, so that's one difficulty and why um, you know, when we accept these top-down solutions, they might not actually be good for everyone because <laughs> they're not ethically based. Uh, but uh, So we can't sit back and just relax, right? Well, no, the point is that whether or not the top-down solution from government works, happens, gets going, doesn't matter because we can create our own uh, local economic systems, local food production systems, uh, local housing productions. We can produce everything we need. And um, it just takes a little effort and to start from a design mind and start thinking about the systems that we use and um, having the courage to actually create something new ourselves. Sounds great. Sounds for me like a call to action. And that's what we can actually yeah. then close the show tonight with. Um, I invite everybody to go to Enso's website, permacultureeducation.org. You can find uh, lots of information on what is permaculture. You find the courses that we mentioned, the design course that I actually can really recommend you. I did it myself. It was a life-changing experience. I can only recommend it really opens your mind. Even if you know lots of things about sustainability, 
Knowing what permaculture goes one step beyond, that's my personal recommendation. You can also start with an introduction course. You can also take that with ENSO. And if you then later on decide to take the next step, everything is accredited and you can use the same credits for the next course. Check out some more information in the description and I hope to stay tuned. So thank you very much, Alan, for your time and I hope to see you here again. Thank you, Dr. Schuster. Thank you. Okay. See you soon.